Good morning. You're listening to Retake Our Democracy, a 30-minute weekly show that airs at 8.30 a.m. every Saturday morning on KSFR 101.1 FM, your Santa Fe public radio station. And I'm Paul Gibson, the host of Retake Our Democracy. Today, we will be talking with Chile Yazi, an indigenous activist, human rights champion, and farmer who has long been part of the efforts to close San Juan Generating Station and other efforts where climate justice and indigenous justice intersect. Joining him is my old pal, Marielle Nanasi, who in her role as a director and chief litigant for New Energy Economy, has been using the courts and the PRC to hold energy and gas and oil industries um, accountable. We'll get to our guests in just a moment, but first a couple of quick announcements and they're quick this week. I wanna remind you that if you're listening to this show while driving around town, and miss any of today's show, you can watch the full YouTube recording of this show and any prior Retake show by going to retakeourdemocracy.org and clicking on Retake on the Radio on the homepage button on the right side of the homepage. It's easy to find. And you will find all of our Retake radio shows um, there in chronological order. So you can binge watch Retake Radio all day, all weekend. What a time. I always have to make a sarcastic remark about doing that, I don't know why. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge that we are conducting this show on stolen Tewa land, and I want to thank our Tewa neighbors for being such good stewards of the land. We could learn more, much more for, about their custodial caring for the land, water, and air, and we better learn it fast. Okay, let's meet our guests, Chile Yazi and Marielle Nanasi. Welcome to the show, Chile and Marielle. Yes, good morning. Good morning, as indeed. We're recording this on thir Thursday morning the, before it will air. Um, I'd like to let our guests introduce themselves, so let's start with Chile, since he has never appeared on our show before, and Marielle is pretty much a regular. So Chile, how did you first become involved in the fight for climate and indig indigenous justice? My um, so-called activism <clears throat> began back in uh, 1969, when the American Indian Movement came to Shiprock. And my education on um, uh, indigenous struggles, uh, not only here in our, uh, in, in, in this area, but throughout the hemisphere uh, began. And I was uh, very much uh, convinced that um, I needed to be a part of the struggle, and that's what my that's what uh, consumed much of my adult life. Hey, thank you, Russell Means. Um, hey, <laughs> uh, Marielle, how about you? You came here from Chicago as a civil rights attorney. How did you wind up a, a litigant in energy and and gas and oil issues? Well, the short story is that um, I when I was learning about the urgency of climate change and climate disruption, I thought, how can I not, um, how can I look at my kids in their eyes and say I didn't use my talents to try and stop the coal burning, which is the single greatest driver of, um, of climate disruption, which is the burning of fossil fuels. So that's when I started to get involved and I learned a little bit about energy. And, I, and now I know a lot more, but I still know a little bit about energy because there's so much to know. I know what you mean. I keep thinking I understand this stuff and then something else comes up and I realize I don't. Um, so we're gonna see if we can sort through some of those issues today. Back to you, Chile. Can you describe the years of indigenous advocacy opposing the operations at San Juan and how responsive or unresponsive it industry has been to that advocacy? My concern on the power plants, not only San Juan, but Four, power, um, four Corners Power Plant uh, began, I would say, in the um, mid-1970s, when the plants uh, essentially released uh, unregulated uh, amounts of uh, pollution into the air. And uh, um, having lived in, my, in Shiprock all my years, we're only 20 miles from uh, these two plants. So 
we ingested um, that pollution that was released by these plants for many, many years. And, um, you know, we, we were conscious that um, our, our children, our families, our lands, our animals, our plants all need um, good, clean air. So we, we um, joined the, um, the efforts to get the plants to uh, minimize the, the uh, production of um, harmful uh, pollutants into the air. And um, somewhere along the way, finally, the, the plants began to put in uh, their wet scrubbers and other, other means to uh, minimize that pollution. So it's, it's been going on for a while. So that's those scrubbers and stuff were things they could have easily done without being pushed. And, and they would have spared that community years of, of toxic air. Absolutely. You know, of course, uh, the bottom line for for the extractive energy is uh, how to make more money with the least effort. And, uh, you know, putting in wet scrubbers at their own initiative would have cost them money. So it had to take our urging and, uh, and uh, other other champions of uh, clean air to to get them to do that. Okay. Just so you know, Paul, just so you know, in in the early 2000s, there was the Richardson administration had had charged PNM, um, who's the operator of, of that plant with 60,000 air quality violations, 60,000. Okay, not to mention all the water, the toxic water they dump. Um, so back where we're, uh, Chile, can you now tell us that now that the San Juan plant has closed, do you feel any sense of validation and maybe even sheer joy that the beast is gone? Or is your focus on the next phase of the work or both? Yeah, it would be both, you know, our our fight to uh, have uh, a clean environment, a, a healthy uh, earth uh, never ends. Um, so that, that struggle continues. Um, of course, the, the closure of the plant um, uh, makes a significant impact on, the, um, on uh, our efforts to have a, a clean environment. And, um, you know, just, just with that, um, we are, uh, it is a milestone uh, toward um, um, attaining a cleaner environment. So, yes. So you're celebrating it. Now I think we're going to hear from Marielle about some of the work that needs to be done. Um, Marielle, I know New Energy Economy is celebrating this closure, but you are also claiming that the work isn't over. Can you tell us about but you, why you are celebrating and then pivot to describe all that is wrong with PNM's plans for San Juan now that the generating station is closed. Yeah, I want to just honor that, you know, the indigenous people who've li literally lived under the toxic shadows of those stacks um, for 50 years now, 50 years, um, you know, can, will breathe cleaner air. I took a picture, uh, I've been working on it for about 14 years. And I took a picture in about 2010 of a, of a little boy who had to use um, a pump to breathe. And I just, he's been my moral compass. And uh, that picture of him has been on the walls in new energy economy for, for those, for, you know, since I took that picture, because it's like, hey, when you're thinking about oh, you get tired or, oh, you don't want to fight anymore. Um, you look at the poisoning that we're doing to our children and then it reinvigorates you to, to work harder. And so this is a really beautiful moment. And just like, it's a milestone, like, like Chili said. Um, and so we have to um, celebrate our victories. And this is a huge one. It's a really huge one. And we will all breathe easier. And... There's a 250 acre site um, at the PNM San Juan generating station. And we know that it's been polluted 
um, contaminating both groundwater and um, and and the and the aquifers for years. Um, there is testimony that has been given. Well, let me just start with one thing: that when you burn coal, there's something called coal ash. Just like in your fireplace, when you burn a log, there's ash on you know ash in the fireplace that remains. Well, when you burn coal, there's ash, and that coal ash is sometimes called is called coal combustion residue is extraordinarily toxic and I don't understand the science behind it but for some reason when it is in the ash form all these toxins come together and have like a um, exponential negative um, toxic impact that could hurt people in terms of cancer and respiratory illnesses and birth defects and the, and the hazardous waste are things like arsenic and selenium and silicon and blah, 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 all these other things. And um, it's a hazardous waste. And what PNM has been doing for 50 years is just throwing it in a dump, um, some parts throwing it into the mine, back into the mine, but sometimes just throwing it into unlined pits. And according to PNM, um, in 2019, they produced 59 million tons of this coal ash. And so that's a lot of, that's a lot of coal ash. And that was only in 2019. I don't have the most recent numbers, but we're afraid. And there's been testimony that this is, go that it has, and it is going to be leaking into, leaching into the groundwater and may ultimately travel into the San Juan River. And that will negatively, uh, that will degrade water quality and negatively impact the environment and public health. So we're calling on with people like Chile and other community members for an independent comprehensive evaluation of the plant. And independent is an important word because we don't want to just rely on PNM um, to do this study. Right now, PNM has what they're calling, this is literally an official term, retirement in place. They might take the stacks down, but what they don't want to do is clean up the mess. And we can't allow that to happen because First of all, it would be an intergenerational inequity. 25 years from now, people who haven't even been born yet are supposed to clean up that mess. No, it has to be an evaluation, an independent investigation, and then a plan for cleanup, and then real monitoring, and ultimately the PS de resistance enforcement. They have to do that. So that's what we're calling for. Okay, all right. So Chile, how do you react to that? Well, the, uh, it's, it's been a, it's been routine for extractive energy industry to, to uh, extract the resources, uh, develop them, make their money and walk away without uh, cleaning their mess. You know, that's a, a to me that's an indictment of um, of uh, America and capitalism, uh, and and specifically I point to the nineteen or the eighteen seventy two Mining Act, uh, which allowed to this day, uh, mine the mines up in southern Colorado who have who continue to uh, pollute our rivers. And you know, um, it 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 should be it need it needs to be mandatory that uh, the the federal government, United States government, uh, require industry to clean up their mess uh, once they've uh, once they've uh, made their monies. Um, you know, that's that's uh, uh, that should be um, that should not. That should be said. That should be said and done without uh, uh, discussion. 
just to show you how naive I am, I just assumed that was the case. I mean, I, I couldn't believe that ENM doesn't really have any legal responsibility to, to clean up this mess. But uh, so what does remediation look like to you, yeah, Shelley? Well, uh, I think that the um, the uh, the coal ash uh, residue that uh, Marielle refers to certainly needs to be um, cleaned up. I don't know how uh, it, it needs to be disposed of, but it needs to be done in a way that it does not filtrate into the um, uh, into the um, uh, waters, the uh, aquifers, and eventually into the river. As farmers here along the San Juan River, you know, that's the main source of our irrigation water. And, and uh, we cannot, we just cannot allow uh, PM and other industry to, to not clean up their mess because um, it certainly contaminates our irrigation water and in turn uh, contaminates uh, our crops and, and uh, the people consume those crops. Yeah. yeah. Another question for Chile. Chile. Um, there have been many times during hearings at the roundhouse at the PRC or at the PRC where gas and oil and or electric utilities were lobbying for legislation or regulation favorable to their profit. And often you find them crowing about support from the tribal governors. Yet at the same hearing, we would see a line of indigenous activists opposing their own governor's position. To what do you attribute this apparent division among the indigenous community? This is something I've heard about every hearing practically. Specifically with uh, our so-called Navajo tribal government, you know, the, 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 the form of government that we have is a copy of the federal system. And it was put in place um, uh, to, to allow the exploitation of oil back in 1923. And uh, so essentially the uh, Navajo government was, was formed so that the oil company could extract the oil. And it wasn't, the, the government wasn't formed to take care of the people. So that's that's been the mindset of the government. That's been the intent and purpose of this government form all of these years. So uh because our government has um uh, profited from uh, extractive energy for so many years um uh our, our, we are also addicted to um uh, energy uh a negative energy in in that in that way and uh sounds they, like most of the united states <laughs> yeah absolutely and uh, so our government is more capitalistic in that in that respect, and they do not um, uh, see the value and the um, uh, traditional um, aspects of uh, of how we need to have a reciprocity of caring for our Earth Mother. And uh, you know our Navajo government leaders, uh, uh, unfortunately, um, have more have a have a mindset more of the capitalistic um, um, worldview than than being the indigenous people that they need to be. So that that's where the distinction comes from. Okay, All right. I'm sorry. I have to take a quick break here to remind our listeners that you're listening to KSFR. And KSFR is more important than ever during this time frame, this era we're in, of misinformation in social media and in the mainstream media. KSFR gives you straight news, gives you great interview conversations, cultural information, music, local music and arts. And uh, all of it comes to you free, but it's not free to, do, to produce. They have uh, a sound engineer and studios to maintain. and um, I would encourage you, if you like to listen to KSFR and or just to this program, um, please go to ksfr.org after you finish listening, click on the donate button and consider it a ticket for admission 
to some great programming. Make them, send them 15, 20, 50 bucks. Um, and just as a, an alert, I'd encourage all of our listeners to start listening to Retake Our Democracy at 8 a.m. and listen to Richard Wolf on economic update. Because if you really want to understand capitalism, he knows it better than anybody. And it's a phenomenal show. And it's a great lead into Retake. So that's my two cents. Um, let's see, I got to move on here. Marielle, I I'm struck by how we see ongoing PM ads describing their commitment to the New Mexico community, with Avangrid's name featured prominently. Given that their merger was rejected in part due, in large part due, to the PRC not believing in PM Avangrid's genuine commitment to the best interests, interests of New Mexico, do you think that PM's behavior at San Juan will hurt them if another round of merger hearings are held? Or have they secured enough support from the legislative and administrative leadership to enable them to glide past assertions of ethical bankruptcy? This is a huge issue. Um, there's been no commitment by Avangrid to, um, to clean up uh, PM. Um, Avangrid has a, unfortunately, a really horrendous track record of unreliability poor service, high rates, um, and um, skirting or straight up violating the rules um, and laws, not only in New Mexico, but all over the United States. So this is not a company that we want to come and quote, serve, unquote, um, in New Mexico. New energy economy is, per is, 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 is on the complete other end of, of that spectrum. We don't want a, a Spanish conglomerate with a, with a track record as it has to take over p &M. We want the people to, to be able to run the energy um, in our tribes and in our municipalities. Um, and that's where what we believe would be the best to serve um, because we can, if they would just get out of the way, um, serve our energy needs with solar and wind and storage um, and local um, and the money stay here and be reinvested in community. Um, so that's what, what we're, we're fighting. But in the meantime, and that's what we, we want to work towards um, because public power is locally controlled, cheaper, and we can get to renewable energy, I believe, in this state within five or seven years, 100% um, renewable. Um, and meanwhile, PM and the other electric monopolies, that they are monopolies, they are granted a, a, a state right to um, have no competition, um, are at, in, the, in the teens um, with their energy. Pen, renewable energy penetration. So it's a big, it's a big transition, and they've been dragging their feet, and we need to move as quickly as possible. In terms of um, this specific issue, in terms of cleanup, we need some outside independent investigation um, by the New Mexico Environment Department, and we are asking people to go to the newenergyeconomy.org backslash. SJGS closure, which stands for San Juan Generating Station Closure, um, and demand this uh, comprehensive investigation um, and requirement for the full, full cleanup. And if Avangrid persists in the merger, which it certainly looks like they're doing if you look at their public relations campaign, then we need to make, all of us need to make um, this is a priority, which is, wait a second, who's going to clean up this big old mess that they have left? And, um, you know, we need to deal with the fact that the site poses an ongoing health and environmental threat to the community. And just like Chile said, um, especially, I mean, New Mexico communities, but especially Diné communities know too well about what happens when industrial polluters are allowed to walk away from projects, from industrial projects at the time of closure without taking care of their responsibility. 
And so, the, you know, this is this is at the heart of the matter. Okay. So I have the same question for each of you, and that is, given the state of the nation and the world and the climate, what brings you, what causes you to have hope? First you, Chile. The commitment that I have uh, in the work to clean up the uh, environment, to uh, minimize pollution, to, to just transition, is uh, looking at the um, <clears throat> troubled world that, that, that is surely to come for our grandchildren into the future. Uh, it's our obligation, our responsibility as parents, grandparents to, to consider their welfare. And uh, we, we have to do all that we can now to assure that they have what I call a comfortable survival. What about, thank you very much for that. What about you, Marielle? What brings you, gives you hope? It's what Chile said. So I think we could just leave it at that. Um, this beautiful place called New Mexico is, uh, is what gives me hope. Love gives me hope. Fighting for justice gives me hope. Uh, this, Closing closing San Juan gives me hope. We need to do it. We need to close four corners, and I think it's on its way. Um, but we also need to be unified in our fight against against uh, these corporate criminals um, who are poisoning our children and poisoning our land and water and air. And we got to call them out. It's not like fun to do it. It's just what's necessary. Um, all right. Well, thank you both for being on the radio show. I'm going to um, close the show now and we'll continue this conversation um, for our YouTube recording kind of informally. Um, but thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, thank you, listeners. We'll be back next week with another show. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, and above all, stay active. It's the only way we fix this mess. Thank you. Okay, we're back. Um, I was going to just say, uh, you know, the questions that I sent to you are, are spent, but um, I had a question about whether or not, I mean, I'm still just mystified that these corporations can come in and do their work for 50 years and then say, we're out of here, see you later. It sounds like a two-year-old, not, not an adult context. I mean, that's what two-year-olds do. They play with their blocks. They leave them all over the floor. You step on them and pick them up or you teach your kids to, to put them away. But this is just nonsense. And what, what could the legislature do to change that dynamic? Or could they do anything? I mean, I think that like what Chile said is this is a dynamic that's persistent um, and it's about the failure of the people um, and the government to hold corporations accountable. And it's ex you're exactly right. Like they create a mess and then they go on and create another mess somewhere else. Um, and we're gonna try to stop that from happening at San Juan. And I mean, we are, we are literally working on and talking to legislators um, about specifically this, not everything, but specifically requiring P&M. And I have to say that some of the other co-owners also don't want, mostly the California co-owners also don't want to just leave it for 25 years so that somebody who's not even born today is going to have to be, you know, inherit this kind of, um, you know, these toxic contaminants. Um, so we're going to try to bring a bill um, that has some money attached to it to help to 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 re require NMED to do an, in, an independent investigation and then monitor and control it. But this is very serious. This is very serious. Most people think, oh, well, of course they're gonna clean it up, but that's just because um, they haven't understood how really sick it is that corporations have have had this much control in our society that they just they just 
ex they don't only extract from the ground, but they extract profit, right? They extract all the profit and then who knows if p and is gonna even be around in 25 years. I mean, just think about that, you know, and then leave the mess for the public to clean up. And that's what we can't allow to happen in this situation. But at the end of 25 years, are they at least obliged to clean this up? No? I mean, not unless NMED holds them accountable to it. Okay. Shelley, what do you think about this? This is just crazy to me. I mean, I, I just, it seems like Mary Ellen said most people think that they're, of course, they're going to have to, because most people apply the same kind of common sense thinking that I just articulated about a little kid with building blocks on the floor. But, it, you know, capitalism doesn't work that way. Julie? Now, to me, I, I look at it, I look at this mess as the showcase for capitalism for the uh, mindset of um, American way of doing business. Um, you know, I, I, I go back further than uh, the, the histories of these uh, recent events, uh, 50, 50 years and on this way. Uh, you know, I, I, um, I, I feel that the uh, the greatest fallacy of uh, Western thought, uh, which predominates and dictates uh, how how America is uh, operated, how the government is operated, how 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 society re, um, uh, l does its business, and what I mean by the, the fallacy of Western thought in, in, in trying to separate the, uh, the physical and the spiritual paradigms. Um, the Western society, Western thought has, has been attempting that for, for many centuries and which led to um, the, the um, the dominance of uh, materiality over, over the, the spiritual aspect. While the indigenous peoples, the, the Tewa people that we reference here on whose lands um, uh, the, the, uh, San, the, the Rio Grande Basin is, is on, uh, we maintain our indigenous um, uh, teachings in that um, there is no separation between the spiritual and the physical. And so that our, our world, our life is, is um, uh, predicated on the, the act of reciprocity between ourselves as human beings and that of the earth. We care for each other. Uh, physically and spiritually and however other way that it matters. The, one of the things that I'm working on now is to, um, to recommend and advocate the um, consideration of what, what we call the indigenous perspective by the New Mexico government powers that be. And uh, we have the ears of the executive right now, and hopefully uh, we will uh, present this discussion to the legislature. But um, we feel like the, 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 the one way that we can uh, rescue ourselves as humanity from the mess that is being created by capitalism is to listen to the indigenous perspective. Uh, there, there is no other way, you know, the comment has been made that there can be no resolution to the climate crisis unless the indigenous uh, perspective is at the table. And that's what's missing in this equation uh, with capitalism and, um, you know, uh, making the last comment on um, the the um, the fallacy of uh, democracy in this country uh, that's not that's not a that's not that doesn't make sense for indigenous peoples because um, 
the extraction of energies from our lands, the, the, uh, the dominance of American society on our lands has been, has been in violation of the, our right to a free and prior and informed consent. We, we have not consented to all of the exploitation that has been perpetrated on our lands and on our people. And uh, that's the damage that uh, capitalism is making. And um, the only way to try to correct that mess is to listen to the indigenous perspective. That's interesting. Well, I would love to hear the debate at the Roundhouse if the indigenous perspective were presented as kind of binding legislation in some fashion. Um, if you could send that to me, um, Julie, I'd appreciate seeing the, uh, if you have a draft of what you're proposing or summary, I'd really like to see it. Because um, it, it's, no, it Paul, seems, seems so perfectly obvious that we need a completely different perspective yes. and set of priorities on how we make decisions. And, it, you know, as long as you have legislators saying, well, you know, we know they're not the best, but we're going to have 150 new jobs or 1,500 new jobs. Oh, great, we've got jobs, you know, but uh, if you were completely destroying the earth for 1,500 jobs, does that make sense? And, and shouldn't you be consulting with the earth about and getting their permission too? And, uh, yeah. you know, it's just crazy. I remember something that I, I heard quite a while ago. It was about um, garbage and what we're doing in terms of our consumerism. You know, we use something once and we throw it away. And then uh, the, whoever the moderator was on this said, what people have to start to understand is there is no away. Um, it's just here and uh, there's no away. And you wouldn't soil your own home. You wouldn't just, you know, throw crap all over the house, you know, but, but we do that outside in our industry. Yeah, Paul, um, if I could, uh... A concrete piece of discussion that uh, I hope to have eventually presented to the uh, legislature is uh, this uh, concept of the rights of nature. The rights of nature has been incorporated into the uh, legal process, the constitution of say like Ecuador and Bolivia and other other governments around the world, uh, the Maori people in New Zealand are very, are very, uh, very much at the forefront of that discussion. And even cities like uh, Santa Monica, California, have elements of the rights of nature discussion. And I would like to see the state of New Mexico be the first state to to objectively and sincerely and respectfully request or uh, consider the realities of uh, what rights of nature uh, discussion is all about. And, and that's one of my intents with this discussion that I'm having with the state. That's very interesting. It would be interesting to see how that would play out because so many decisions made in the legislature and not just, I'm not picking on New Mexico. New Mexico is probably better than most, um, but uh, it's just the way capitalism does its business, and it always has been, you know, and it's just like there's no respect for it. all the costs that are incurred by the earth are externalized and left for others to deal with. And uh, we obviously can't continue to do that. Um, I hope Florida is learning their lesson. <laughs> um, so, uh, Marielle, do you have any added thoughts to uh, what Chile is saying about the rights of nature? I think it, it's beautiful. Um, and I think that what, what our system does um, or the system that's imposed on us is it internalizes profit and it socializes toxicity and um, problems. And, and we need to, to change that. We need to live in a, a life um, that values social profit, um, which is the concern and care for the land and the water and the earth because it's our only home. Mm -hmm. um, um, and we can't live without those things. And um, we're seeing more and more destruction happening all the time. And what's crazy is that there's a, you know, 
I think it's important to see that while we're having seeing climate disruption and all these fierce responses, whether it's Pakistan or Japan or Mississippi or Florida, and you know, democracy is literally hanging by a thread because we are experiencing fascism. And that is the control of our government by corporations. It's not just those crazy Nazis that are, you know, in the street, though that's scary as well. But it's also about that the, the rights of people and the rights of nature have, uh, with, you know, and are being um, devastated. And that, and if you want to know why suicide rate is up, and you want to know why drug use is is up, and you want to know why there's so many ills in our society. I mean, just look at the, look at the ads on TV. They're like all for drug companies. And it's because you can't poison the environment and not think that we're going to be poisoned too. That's our food. That is our food. And um, it's very scary what kinds of um, just irresponsibilities sound so like lame compared, you know, because, but it's, it's gross irresponsibility, it's gross negligence. Um, and that's why it's important that the study, the investigation um, by NMAD be done now. So first of all, we could just know what the extent of it is. Um, I only talked about one of the things um, that PNM, you know, one of the big issues at the PNM plant is the coal combustion residue, also known as coal, coal ash. But there is a nitrate plume um, that is in that's in um, in the plant and in the water and in part of the there's a ev evaporation pond, which is even can see think about that. They're hoping to put it in, or they have been putting it in un, in pits hoping that it just evaporates. These sulfur dioxides and chlorides and nitri nitrates just evaporate into the air. That's their, that's their plan. I mean, it's just sickening. And, you know, you look at somebody like the little boy that I took that picture of and like, what kind of system do we have that we knowingly poison our children? What, what, what is that? One of the things that should be part of the New Mexico Energy Dep Environment Department is that what we're doing is committing murder. Yes. And, and if we're committing murder, let's at least know we're committing murder. Yeah. We're doing it behind closed doors and shielded from our eyes. And maybe if we knew we were committing murder, we'd do something about it. Yeah. I mean, I just will say that like PNM's own testimony is that there was 14 major discharges of contaminants on, onto the earth and, and into the groundwater since. 2014, um, what has been done? What has been done? Nothing. Who's going to suffer? Is it that we care so little about our native brothers and sisters that we're just going to not, you know, just turn your a blind eye and go on to the next thing? No, we cannot do that. Well, like our humanity that is at stake. It's a good thing that there are some advocates out there that see it that way, because we've got a couple of centuries of history that say that Americans will do that um, to indigenous people. So, um, yeah, uh, we do. Um, so it'll be interesting. But that impacts our, you said, you know, like how, that also impacts our own humanity. Like, so. I have a, 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 another question. Do, you mentioned the rights of nature. Actually, um, do you know the Green Amendment? Are you familiar with the Green Amendment that's being proposed for New Mexico? It's not quite rights of nature, but it's saying that New Mexicans have the right to clean air, clean water, and clean land, and that they can sue uh, the government to enforce that right. Um, they can't sue for money, but they can sue to make people, make the government do its job to protect people. I'm, I'm aware of the the uh, development of the Green Amendment, and uh, that's certainly a positive uh, step in that in the right direction. Um, you know, hopefully that uh, that kind those kinds of initiatives uh, continue because right now uh, the trajectories that we're on 
that are that are are put in place by the 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 governments, uh, federal state governments, and uh, the extractive in industry is that. Uh, our our trajectories, the trajectories for the humanity, for the planet, are 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 not good. You know, we sh we needed to um, listen to the, uh, the the 2012 uh, change of the Mayan calendar. You know, we have we have uh, indigenous uh, prophecies that tell about these late later days and uh you know we're 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 coming into those times and we're seeing the the um the eventuation of uh some of those um uh dire warnings that we have that we have amongst our people and uh we're aware of that as people who are conscious of the needs of the earth but it's the industrial the the politicians the the bureaucrats that need to listen to what we're saying to um if they have any interest in in rescuing the planet for for our grandchildren to come can you articulate a little bit more about those prophecies julie well um of course our our prophecies um have dire warnings in that if this comes to pass um this will be the demise of uh, humanity and the planet and so on. But they are very much uh, in concert with uh, the underlying message of the Mayan uh, change of the calendar in that, yes, uh, we are at a pivot or a, 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 a uh, very uh, major uh, pivot point. Uh, we either continue on the the trends that we that we have in exploiting the earth um and and enriching the 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 developers and um, ignoring the health of the earth ignoring the pleas of the people if we don't change that then then we're we're coming to a drop off point that uh, we do not want to see but there is opportunity also for us to um, assess where we are and to make that uh, make that great change. You know, the the Hopis uh, also have a great prophecy that that is very that is very much uh, in in line with what the Mayan uh, ch calendar change talk about. And um, you know, it's it just comes down to. Uh, whether or not we want to continue to have life on this planet. And uh, if we do, then we need to adhere to those warnings. And, uh, you know, that's, <laughs> that's what it comes down to. Maybe and, that's uh, why the, Elon Musk is like got a T-shirt about going to Mars and uh, they can go up. These capitalists can spend billions and go up to Mars and destroy it. Um, the pictures I've seen of Mars don't look all that appetizing. Um, I'm happy here for now. Ariel? Yeah, I, I mean, the, the, go ahead, Chili. You know, it's just uh, so much of a, a joke for me, you know, that the one percenters have that uh, capacity to shoot themselves off to another planet. Well, uh, the, the 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 billions of of us that are left behind are are going to suffer uh, our demise, the demise that they have created, and uh, you know it's um, I don't see that um, that there is there is that there is going to be the kind of fruition that they hope to see with their explorations out there it's it's just a it's just a massive uh sickening joke to me that um they think they can uh propel themselves out there into outer, outer space and continue to 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 live you know that that just doesn't that's not um the two year old that's not the way it's supposed to be it's a two year old 
it's the same as PM leaving uh, San Juan the way it is and just let somebody else clean it up and we're we're yeah. out of we're, we're on to the next frontier. Yeah. Well, 80 percent of all global heating is caused by the fossil by the burning of fossil fuels. And yet our our world leaders, it's not, you know, and this administration and our New Mexico administration keeps calling for the expansion of fossil fuels. And, you know, and why? It's because of the corruption of the fossil fuel industry. It's like controlling, that's controlling these politicians. And it's it's basically legalized bribery, right? Oh, we'll give you money for your campaign and then we're gonna close our eyes to the pollution that you're causing now, which is an environmental hazard, but also the, the cumulative impacts of, um, of of all this burning is is causing um, climate disruption, and we're seeing it. We're seeing it with hurricanes and fires and flooding and heat waves, um, and and it's infecting crop yields and um, and losses, and you know, and that and that and we're seeing corresponding increases in food prices, and you know, and then all the diseases that are associated with all of that, which is you know diabetes and blah 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 blah. blah. We can't keep continuing this same way. It's killing us. It's killing us. And so the first and the hardest thing is to tell, hold these corporations a accountable. Um, but that's what we have to do. Okay. Well, I don't want to take any more of your time. This is, I, I literally, I think I could sit here and talk to you two all day long. Um, but I don't know how many of our listeners would... Uh, watch a three and a half hour conversation with Mary Ellen Chile, no matter how compelling. Um, but uh, I want to really thank you both a good, a lot for your, taking your time. And Chile, I didn't give you a chance during the broadcast, but can you tell people how they can find out more about what your work is about? Well, we don't have a website. All I can do is uh, rattle off my email for anybody interested. It's a uh, C H I L I Chile underscore Yazi Y A Z Z I E at Hotmail. Okay. Well, thank you, Chile. Um, and thank you, Marielle, always. Um, thank you both. And, uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, onward into the fog. We'll, we'll get it done somehow. Thank you very much. Blessings to both of you. Yes. Bye bye.